style thing. Again, Zoom makes the presentation live. And so, yes, John, you speak into the microphone, but the iPad tab here is recording this program to everybody. So the microphone is on in this room. So if you talk or laugh or have a question, everybody will hear it. <laughs> and those of you watching on I kept on your at home, if you could please mute yourselves at home, because we can hear anything you say too. Not as easily though, so it's just a little, a little like that. Okay. So do you want to say a thing? <laughs> Uh, I wanted to do this talk here. I've done this a couple of other places, uh, most recently in Stockton. Actually, I was on one of those tours that I do lecturing on, and went all over Stockton, and so I put this together as part of what they call the. Well, that's the uh, so this is. Uh, more elaborate than it might be if I were just doing it for you guys. And there's a ton of information in here. I just uh, couldn't throw anything out. It was too exciting. So I uh, thought this was a good way to start here. <laughs> so my, my goal is to talk about uh, the Kings and Queens of Scotland. And interestingly enough, there were several kings that were Scottish. Uh, this was unusual in Europe at the time, and then the Scots and then, of course, the British did it as well. So I'm going to look at this in uh, six topical areas. We're going to look at the medieval guys, then Braveheart and Robert the Bruce. Everybody knows who Braveheart is, and you totally don't. The Stuart dynasty. Then Protestantism really affects the Scots a lot and messes up the uh, religion here. Then we have the United Kingdoms where everything comes together in uh, 1707. And then by the rise of all the Jacobites, who were the, sort of the tail end of the attempt to have an independent Scotland. So we're going to strap on our speed skates and see how far we can get with this. Start out with the Scottish monarchs. Scotland at the period that we're starting with, around 900, 1000 AD, really was an independent country at all. It was just a bunch of tribes and clans all uh, hanging around it there. And there are four major groups, the Norse, the Norwegians that come down. The Scots on the left were actually imports from Ireland, the Scottish people. On behalf of the people, we cannot see or hear. Then we have the, the Britons and the Anglican at the bottom, and some more Gales, they would be Irish again. So it's a big mess, and there is no central government or a central authority at all. The first person who is rated as a king, and I want to warn you that everybody who is the head of a clan calls himself a king in these days, but this fellow, Kenneth MacAlpin, is the first one who is recognized as a genuine king over a large group of people, not just his clan. The sound. He was the head of the pits, and he was the first sort of nationalist leader that they had up there in the north. But he was not in charge of the Scots or the uh, Saxons or the Britons. That waited a couple of generations until we get to. Now, this is not working. Let me pass there. Until we get to Malcolm, oh, I can go there. That's cool. Malcolm is the one who actually connected the Scots and the Picts, and so he is known as the King of Alba. And occasionally, you run across Alba as a place. It's just an alternative name for Scotland. Uh, so he is King of Alba, but it's still a lot of organized country at all. His son, Duncan, who you probably have heard of is the one who really pulled things together. He suppressed the independence of the Angles and the Saxons down in the south. So he is the first one who is king of all of them, but he's really king of most of the Scots at this time. 
Now you're probably familiar with the name Duncan because he figures prominently in a very famous play by Shakespeare. He was uh, not a popular king at all. Everybody hated him. Uh, Macbeth, who was uh, actually just an earl at the time, or they called it fame in the play, but he was an earl, organized a group of people to try to take him out and oust him, and they succeeded in 1040. And as you know from the play, uh, Macbeth theoretically killed uh, Duncan, uh, because you know, Duncan's ghost keeps showing up in the play. But the first real solid leader of the thing is Macbeth, and I've got him still listed as King of Alba. The most surprising thing about this slide is he was actually king for 17 years. You get the idea in the play that it lasts about three weeks and then he's killed. But he really was king for a long time. And he was actually a pretty good king. As you go back, there are some bad kings and good kings. He was one of the good guys. He was pretty decent. But the son of Duncan, of course, had an issue with him. And so, as things went, <clears throat> here we have uh, Macbeth as the king of all the king's gods. Uh, this is, of course, uh, not what he looked like at all. They just made that up. And here's even less of it. But Macbeth then was kicked out by the son of Duncan who was Malcolm III. Malcolm ruled for a long time. He was even longer alive than Macbeth. And his name is Canmore, which actually means big head, because apparently he had a large head on a small body, but that was his name. That was his family's name. So the Canmores are in charge for the next few years. Malcolm was uh, not a great king. He was okay. Uh, he didn't do much uh, of note. He, his biggest issue was he wanted to conquer Northumbria. And I don't know if you know anything about England, but Northumbria is in the northeast, just below the Scottish border. And since he was a miner, he was trying to collect that part of the country too. He raided Northumbria five times over the course of his reign. And he was finally killed in the last effort to try to take it over. It very unsuccessful. The most important thing he did was he married well. He was married at first to a local person, but she died quickly. And there was a woman named Margaret who was a Saxon. And the Saxons, of course, did not like the Normans who were now invading the area. So uh, she was trying to escape from the Normans, and her ship uh, touched down in, in Scotland, and uh, Malcolm fell head over heels in love with her, married her, and then she was his wife, and produced multiple sons over the next few years. She is a saint because she was the most pious person I've ever run into on this talk. She was very, very uh, religious. And she was so good at this that her son, David, had her canonized by the Pope. If you ever go to Scotland, you may go to Edinburgh Castle, and there is a special chapel built just for her. It's called the St. Margaret's Chapel. And I actually spent a very nice time in this chapel one afternoon. Uh, my wife and I, well, I should explain, I taught at the University of Alaska two different times, so we were in Scotland a lot uh, in, the, in the 90s and early 2000s. One day we were up in Edinburgh Castle, and it was snowing, and it was snowing horizontally. It was a horrible day. <clears throat> Edinburgh Castle's on the top of this high rocky uh, volcanic thing, and it was just a terrible day. So Cindy and I decided to retreat to the chapel. What we didn't realize is everybody else up there retreated to the chapel too. And pretty soon we had about 200 people crammed in this little room waiting out the storm. So I have uh, interesting memories of my visit to St. Margaret's Chapel. <clears throat> St. Margaret and uh, Malcolm died just very close to one another, and they left a kind of an awkward situation. She had four sons 
who were all, at one time or another, kings of Scotland. And it gets very confusing in there, so confusing that we're going to jump right ahead to her fourth, her youngest son, David. He becomes king of the Scots in 1124. And like his father, he ruled for a long time, about 30 years. David took after his mother. He was a very religious, pious person. His main accomplishment was to build a series of four very beautiful abbeys down along the borderlands. And uh, they were absolutely stunning structures for the time. Here are the ruins of Jedburgh Abbey, founded in 1147 by King David. It was destroyed by uh, Henry VIII of England, who came up and just wrecked the place during his, his reign. But David was a, a pretty good fellow and uh, just couldn't handle the, uh, the, the job. It was really beyond him. At one point, he was invited to uh, help out now. So he raised a big army. He went down there. He was captured. Uh, you know, things didn't go well. But he was uh, one of the more highly respected in the of kings. He was replaced by his, uh, I think this is his grandson, actually, William the Lion, uh, King of Scots. Again, another long uh, reign, 1165 to 1214. William uh, had terrible trouble with the English. At one point, he was uh, imprisoned by King Henry II and lived in England in, in prison for six years, and they let him loose and he wanted him back up there. Uh, it was only when Henry died and Richard the Lionheart became king that things actually went better for William. William did do one very interesting thing. He decided to design his own outfit. This is the Scottish Royal Standard. And according to the actual rules, only the ruling king of Scotland can actually fly this banner. Now, if you go to Scotland these days, it's all over the place with the salt here, which is the national flag. Uh, but officially, it can only be worn by the king. And we'll see one down the line who's wearing this outfit. Okay. Richard the Lionheart, as you all know from uh, your, if you know your Islam, uh, went off to the Crusades, he was captured, and his younger brother John took over. King John was the bad guy in the Robin Hood series. He's also the bad guy as far as Scotland is concerned. He uh, objected to William trying to take over Northumbria again, and one of the few things that King John did successfully was uh, squash the Scottish rebels. He then, a year later, was, of course, hauled up by the barons and began the Magna Carta. So William died disappointed uh, because of his poor relationship with the English. William was replaced by Alexander II. And Alexander, was a much more successful king than his father. But he had a particular problem, and that is that he was uh, being assaulted from the northwest by the king of Norway, by the king First of all, he decided to settle things better with the English. So he married Henry III's sister. No. So there is a connection there between the Tudors and he was in Scotland. But King Hawken of Norway, who controlled Shetland and Orkney and the Outer Hebrides, was moving in and moving as far as Glasgow on the mainland, uh, trying to take over. And Alexander uh, was killed in the battle, trying to get rid of him. So he died, and his son. Oh, and one good thing is that uh, in 1237, because he was on good terms, Alexander II was on good terms with the English, 
because he married the king's sister. They did sign a treaty in New York, which defined the boundary between Scotland and England, any of the south, Scotland and the north. And over all time, this border has remained the official border between Scotland and England. hard to write It's very nice to know. Uh, it runs a lot, it's called the Shed Hill. Hills. It's a very beautiful. That's your wish that you were with And it hooks him down here and goes up uh, just, just more than he does. <clears throat> okay. Alexander III. I'm running through these very quickly. I'm going to tell you better stories when we get to more interesting characters. Alexander III was only eight years old when he became king, so he was not able to do very much. But by the time he got to be a teenager, when he was 17, he came to his own. He kicked out the regents, and immediately he was facing the threat of Hawking from Norway. Oh, I'm ready. Oh, and what he did was a clever strategy. It's called what Muhammad Ali called rope and dope. He knew all these guys, these Norwegians were up there, and they were all ready to attack. And so Alexander kept fading away and kind of hiding out. And pretty soon, Hawking was so frustrated, and he was running out of supplies and all that, that he finally just gave it up and died shortly thereafter. So Alexander was able to basically fake out the uh, Norwegians, and he decided to do something smart. He decided to have his daughter marry the new king of Norway, and so his daughter Mary married the king of Norway, and this set up the whole peace arrangement between the two countries, which persisted, well, currently it's still there. There were still some issues about Sheldon and Lord being there down a little later, but William deserved, I mean, excuse me, Alexander deserved the credit for solving this problem with Norway. His personal life was very unfortunate. He married, his wife uh, had a couple of kids, all three of them died, and he he was this morale because, of course, one of the king's main jobs is to produce offspring. So he was morose, and in 18, uh, excuse me, 1285, he found a young, willing woman to marry. So he married her, and he was really thrilled about the prospect. And he was off in the country at one point, and he was eager to get back to Edinburgh to uh, be with his new wife. And he was riding along, and his, his uh, followers said, Hey, don't, the, the weather's bad. There's going to be a duration or something. You don't want to go out on your own. Uh, they said, Oh, I'm trying to get back. He wants to get back to Israel. They found him the next morning at the bottom of a cliff. The assumption is that his horse tripped and fell over on top of it. So he was killed in a most unfortunate way. But he had no children. So now what happens? The line is broken and things get wait, it's not broken. What about his what about his daughter, Mary? Oh yeah, his daughter had married the king of Norway. So let's go up to Norway and see what's going on there. Good, good. His daughter had a daughter. His daughter had died, but there was a daughter of his daughter named Margaret. And so, according to the rules, she is the one that should be the Queen of Scots. So here we have the first example of a queen in her own right. Margaret, known as the Maiden Norway, was the Queen of Scots. And this establishes a very important precedent for her going down the line uh, relative uh, Mary. Edward the, Edward the First in England thought this was a great opportunity. So he said, okay, what we'll do is I'll have my son, Edward, who became Edward II, he'll marry Margaret. And then we'll have this marriage contract between the two countries. Isn't that a great idea? Margaret's four years old, but we'll just get married. That'll be cool, right? So they send the ship up to Oslo. And they bring her back, and they 
had uh, the, the ships that make sweet meats and, and uh, very fine things to entice the little girl out of the ship. It didn't do any good. She died when the ship reached the orphanage. So there goes the whole point. And that means the Scottish soul is vacant. Well, Edward's not going to bother with that. What he decided to do is he'd poke in and see if he could find somebody who would be an amenable guy to go with him. And so we're going to get into the next phase of great heart and love and fruit. There were two contenders for a king. These guys were both great grandsons of David back there. Uh, and so they both had a claim to be legitimate. One is John Balliol, and the other is Robert the Bruce. Edward decided that Balliol would be much more easy to lead around. So he arranged, um, bought favors, and provoked everybody to vote for him. So Balliol becomes king of the Scots. And for about a week and a half, things were fine. But Balliol got really annoyed being pushed around by Edward. So eventually he raised an army and went into opposition. And of course, Edward's army was much bigger. And Balliol was uh, captured. He was in prison. Uh, he eventually ended up in exile in France. So that hadn't worked very well. So we have a period here really from 1292 until 1314, when there's no clarity in who is the boss. Edward had the nickname Hammer of the Scots because he was really pushing everybody around. He was not a nice guy. He was not a good neighbor. After he had defeated John Balliol, he took the Stone of Scone. Most people say it's a Stone of Scone, but it's actually a Stone of Scone. And he hauled it off to Westminster Abbey. This is the ceremonial stone upon which Scottish kings were crowned. So he just confiscated the stone, took it back, and stuck it under a chair in Westminster Abbey, where it still stayed until the 1960s when a couple of Russian uh, college students stole it back. So he was not a nice guy at all. And he was unpopular with William Wallace. William Wallace, his nickname was Braveheart. He was not a king. He was, he was actually a nobleman, a minor nobleman, not even an earl or anything of that kind. Uh, but he got crosswise with the English very early in life. The story is he may have killed a couple of English uh, soldiers, and so he was uh, kind of a, a criminal in the English eyes. Uh, then uh, he Apparently, uh, fell in love with a woman in uh, Lanark, which is a town in Scotland, and she got pregnant, and he was all set, either married or not sure whether he married or not, but they were a couple. And so one night he snuck into town and uh, wanted to see his beloved. And the sheriff of the town, of the town chased him out and then executed the woman. For a betting and known criminal. Not a very good plan for getting this guy unhappy because this guy looks like this. <laughs> this is a fanciful 20th century. I don't know how many, how many of you seen the movie Great Heart. Okay. I was flying over to Scotland and the guy in the seat next to me was watching me put that little screen. But I thought, oh my gosh, it's so full of. Terrible anachronisms. The blue paint. Nobody since the Picts had painted themselves blue. In fact, Pict is supposedly descended from the fact that they painted themselves. They painted themselves with something called woad, which is something you find out in the forest. And the belief among the Picts was that if you paint yourself all blue, your enemy can't harm you. Well, of course, nobody painted himself blue for a thousand years when Mel Gibson made this movie, but he thought, hey, that'd be cool. He was going to have his whole face blue, and then the, the makeup guy said, no, I'm going to make it stripy. How about making it stripy? 
The other thing, uh, just a minor thing that's wrong with me, is he ran around of kilts. Kilts were in there for another 400 years. But we're not letting this kind of stuff bother us very much. Another problem is that you see these huge battles with the English army and the Scottish army. That didn't happen either. That only happens under the Napoleonic era when you get mass armies. Most of the fighting in this era was like William trying, I mean, like Alexander trying to not have a fight. So that doesn't work either. Uh, Mel Gibson made a movie called The Patriot, and he staged the same battle at the end of the, of the uh, movie for the Americans running across the One of the worst aspects of this is one of the key characters in the movie is a French princess. And Mel Gibson, excuse me, Braveheart, ends up having a conversation with her. Do you think there's something going on? Well, she was actually five years old at the time and never met him. You know, artistic <laughs> license. So, what did he really do? Did he do anything? Yes, he was a very good guerrilla warfare uh, rebel. He hung out in the woods and he, his little group would go out and kill English soldiers or English people. And so he got a following because everybody hated Edward. And recently got a pretty big following, big enough to capture control of uh, the area around Stirling Castle. This is, gives you an idea of what goes on here. Glass goes on the west, Edward's on the east, and Stirling's right in the middle on the Fourth River. Edward's on the Firth of Ford, which is just the mouth of the Ford River. So Sterling's on the Ford River, which is pretty small. So if you control Sterling Castle, you control everything that they want. And so Edward decided he had to get rid of these sky rebels. But he was involved in a war in Holland or France or somewhere. So he sent a couple of other guys up to deal with uh, William Wallace. And he literally had to go pathetically bad. What they did at the Battle of Stirling Bridge is the Scots were on the north up there, protected by this big uh, lump of rock. There's the castle. The English troops arrived, and their local Scottish allies said, Well, if you just go up another couple of miles, this river becomes nothing. You just walk across. And the English guys, well, no, just go across this bridge here. The bridge was so narrow that only two or three horses could go over side by side. And so they started going across. When about half of their cavalry was across, the Scots surrounded them and just absolutely devastated them. The Scots had invented something, they didn't have a lot of cavalry, they didn't have a lot of artillery. They invented something. Well, here's, here's a fancy picture thing for this. They invented a thing called the Shiltron. Here, you just had a whole mob of guys with these incredibly long pikes. And no matter how tall a horse you're on, you can't get past this. This is like a human uh, fortress. This is exactly what Alexander the Great did uh, back in the uh, in 200 BC. They had the same kind of concept. So, Wallace had Shiltrons over there. The cavalry couldn't get past them. They were caught here. It was a huge deal. The uh, lead the military commander of the battle uh, was killed. The story is that uh, William Wallace must had him uh, skin and had a belt made out of the skin that he wore from that. The problem that the Scots had is they had no uh, castle equipment, nothing to, to beat down a castle. This is actually Urquhart Castle on Loch Lomond, and they've got a trebuchet, which is this huge, huge uh, cavalry, and it throws these. These balls are about this big of stone. And they have, if you go there, they've got movies of this thing hurling the stone you know, half a mile with all the energy. But the 
the Scots didn't have this. So they had to rely on the sugar on it. Well, Edward I was very upset at the loss of Stirling Bridge, so he decided to really do the job right. He set off, he came back from where he was in Europe, came back, organized a huge army, and marched north. He was depending upon getting supplies by sea, but as it turned out, the only ship that managed to get to Edward was a ship full of uh, huge, they call them tons, T-U-N-S, of wine. And all that was the only supplies they had, so they distributed the troops. And about 100 soldiers were killed in the ensuing raid. Apparently the Welsh really were not the best uh, co-fighters here. So it looked like things were not going well. Edward decided it was time to go home. But then he heard that Wallace was at Falkirk. And we have rear dead row, here's Glasgow, here's Sterling Hall, real close. So he organized his army, they rushed up to Falkirk. And the Scots set their system up. They got four shield columns, and they got archers in between. But they placed themselves very poorly because there was no way you could attack directly because this is all swamp land on this little area here. So the English had to go around to the sides of an envelopment, and the Scots were completely destroyed in the south. So this battle of Falkirk was the same level of battle of Stern Bridge, but the English won. So Wallace went back to the uh, back of the woods and ran around for the next few years hiding out. Let's get back to the kings now. After John Balliol is in exile in France, a couple of people decide that they should be now in charge of Scotland. One is Robert the Bruce, and the other guy is a John, guy named John Cumberland. And the powers that be named them Guardians of Scotland. Now, the reason this is interesting is that side of the seal is uh, St. Andrew. Andrew is the guy who was martyred and said, I don't deserve to be on a cross like Christ. Crucify me on you know, an X. So there is uh, Andrew crucified on an X instead of uh, on a cross. And that's the pattern for the Scottish flag. This is a memory, it's called the St. Andrew flag because it recognizes that. So, their guardians of Scotland was not mean, who knows? But, Robert the Bruce is the one who emerges out of this mess as the ultimate guy. He and John Condon were cooperating up to a point as guardians, and then in, in uh, 1306, uh, they met at a church to discuss things in Dundee, and only one of them came out of the church. Uh, they don't know exactly why, nobody was in there, there's no recordings, but it's quite clear that Robert the Bruce killed John Condon in the church. That was a horrible crime, so bad that he was immediately excommunicated. And everybody thought that was the end of Robert Bruce. But what he did instead was he immediately got on his horse and galloped over to, to uh, Bob's castle and had himself named king. So he just, I'm going to be it, I'm going to be God. And uh, but he really complained too much. He was a great grandson of David. His opposition, Balliol, was in France. So he was then the guy that everybody thought should be the new king of Scots. So what did he do after being named king in 1306? He did the same thing William Wallace did. He hung out in the woods, he did guerrilla uh, raids, he did a bunch of stuff, and eventually got a group of followers. 
but he never really won a big battle until 1314. Chris Tom Powell, this is where he went to the crown. <clears throat> so he then uh, went to Okay, so what he did was he finally uh, confronted the English armies. We're now in the Edward II era. Edward I was the hammer of the Scots. Edward II was kind of like the, uh, the uh, ping pong hammer of the Scots. He was not very effective at all. And they organized they, themselves again just south of Stirling Castle. And there was a big confrontation. Uh, the English had three times as many soldiers on the ground as the Scots did. But the Scots had developed a new military strategy. They were using the shieldron, but they were movable shieldrons. So they were not easily trapped like the stable ones were. So these mobile shieldrons moved around, and the British could not, or the English could not figure out how to deal with it. And it was a huge. Victory. At the Battle of Anakin. Can you tell which one is the king? You know, if you're going to go into battle, <coughs> why would you wear the yellow outfit so everybody know where it is? Anyway, the Battle of Anakin is the biggest Scottish victory in history. It establishes Bruce. As the king, nobody can uh, do anything about it now. 16, 13, 14, and we're off and running with Robert Bruce. After the Battle of Bannockburn, Edward II was continually trying to deal with this problem that he couldn't. He was just an ineffective leader. So Bruce raided into northern England. And then the next year, he raided down in Northwestern England. And everybody down here is just, you know, hopeless. You know, where's the help here? The king can't do anything. Uh, here we are in 1318, 1319. Robert Bruce can go anywhere he wants in Northern England. Terrible situation. In 1320, tired of being ignored by the rest of the world, a group of noblemen met at Arbroath Abbey and wrote up this document. It's called the Declaration of Arbroath, in which they, it was really an appeal to the Pope to cancel Robert the Bruce's excommunication and recognize him as the legitimate king of Scotland. It's a marvelous document. It, it ranks up there with the, with the uh, Magna Carta as the most important political document. In Scottish history. And here's one of the statements that it, it is in truth not for glory or riches or honors that we're fighting, but for freedom, for that along which no honest man gives up but from life itself. Well, the Pope did and not excommunicate him. So he continued raiding. Look how far down it is now. And finally, in uh, 1327, Isabella, the French wife of King Henry, of King Henry II, said, this is enough. So she intrigued with her own son, who became Edward III, and said, kick the old guy out of the way and take over, which worked out fine because the old guy died fairly quickly at that point. So Edward III comes in, and he decided to make peace with Robert the Bruce. And they signed the treaty of Edinburgh. And it says, Scotland shall remain forever divided in all things from the realm of England, entire, free, and quit, without any subjugation, servitude, claim, or demand. So we have now, uh, 40 minutes into the talk, established Scotland's independence, which was the objective of these people from the beginning. So, at that point, I am going to have to take a, a couple of minutes. If you have any questions, this is so fast. 
We're going to do the Stewart's next, and you know more about them than you know about the Robert the Bruce and William Wallace are the two great heroes of Scottish medieval history. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's look at the Stuarts. The Stuarts are the ones that hung in there. It's amazing, as you see the story that they did. First of all, let's get this straight. You'll run across the Stuarts being called any of these three names. The bottom one is the one that the historians use. The Steward is the title that the first member of the family had. He was the ancestral hereditary steward of Scotland. I don't know if you know anything about Japanese history, but there is a guy called the Shogun, who is the ancestral hereditary military commander of the Japanese Empire. <clears throat> steward is the same kind of an idea. His job passed from generation to generation. Sometimes they spell it with a T, sometimes they spell it Stuart this way. It's all the same thing, and it ties back to this person who had the job of being uh, kind of the political uh, leader of the country. When the Treaty of Edinburgh was signed, there was a moment of great relief and excitement in Scotland. And it lasted about that long. Robert the Bruce died a couple of months after the signing of that treaty. And when he died, he only had a five-year-old son, David, who had all this on to him. So there's a tremendous amount of pressure on David the second. He's the second because <clears throat> we saw David the first way back there at the Abbey's. Okay, David the second was king, but when Robert Bruce died, they made an agreement that he would be king, but if he had no offspring, then the title, the kingship, would pass to. 
the son of Marjorie Bruce Stewart, who is Robert Bruce's daughter. She had married the steward. So she is Mary Bruce Stewart. You see the spelling here. She's Mary the steward. And the idea is if David dies without issue, then her son Robert will become king. Well, David hung on for a long time. He was, as we can see, he's there for, gosh, what is it, 30, 40, 40 odd years. But he wasn't there all the time. He uh, got in trouble with the English, and the English eventually captured him after a battle and kept him in London for many, many years. And during that period, while he's in captivity, <coughs> Robert, the son of Marjorie and the grandson of Robert the Bruce, Robert is running a show up in Edinburgh. So he's got a lot of practice in running things while David is hanging around basically in jail in the south. This was working so poorly that the English king decided that, yeah, I'm tired of having this loser around. Loser, right? Tired of having this guy around here. So he arranged with the Scottish authorities that they would pay a ransom and, and give him back. So they sent him back, and then Scotland was on the hook for paying off this enormous ransom for this king that nobody really wanted, and he died a couple of years later, and they were still paying the ransom years after he had died. So the English put a full of these are on. Okay. So here's Robert. And this is not a fanciful 17th century. This is a, a current thing. I don't know if he really looked like that. He looks like a playing card guy. <laughs> <laughs> he is the first steward of honor. He's the one that established the dynasty. So he's very important in that one. He was only king for 19 years because he waited all this time while David was messing around. Uh, but that was uh, the way it worked. Okay. Robert III, his son, was named king when Robert II died. <clears throat> Robert III had a problem. When he was a kid, he'd been kicked by a horse. And he was, as they say in those days, not all there. And he realized he really wasn't up to being king. So after he was, uh, you know, got all through the stuff, he thought, I'm, I'm getting out of here. I'm quitting. This isn't working at all. So, uh, they knew that the kingship was going to pass to his son, a guy named James. And so in order to protect James from the still very virulent English issue, they decided to send James on a ship to France. There had been a long time, they call it the All Reliance, a long time relationship between France and Scotland. So they sent James on this boat. Heading for Europe. James was just a kid at the time. And unfortunately, pirates captured the ship. And then when the pirates found out that they had the uh, prospective king of Scotland on the boat, they immediately sailed down to London and sold him to the English. So the whole era of now English hands failed. He was in England for about 20 years. <clears throat> While there, he learned about the, the Norman stuff. Scots had been kind of insulated from the Norman influence, but he picked up on it, he liked it a lot. So he married Joan Beaufort in London in 1424, and the British then feeling that they had done their best to train him and, and get him to be a friend of England, uh, sent him back to Edinburgh where he was very unpopular. Who is this guy showing up in England with all these Norman ideas? So there was a lot of opposition to him. But he proved to be a pretty competent guy. He organized things. He got a lot of allies. 
he was able to fend off his enemies for a long time. But then in uh, 1437, a cabal of opponents was out to get him. So he uh, decided he was going to have to get out of here. And, and uh, they were assaulting their room a bit, the gentleman the James room there. And he discovered that there was a, an air vent in the floor, so he crawled into it. And then Joan threw a rug or something over it. And then Joan, oh, no, he's not here. No, he's not here. He's gone. Don't worry. Well, he was in the air vent. What he didn't realize was the day before, because it was right next to the tennis court, and tennis balls kept flipping up and falling into this vent that the workers had sealed off the vent to keep the tennis ball from falling in. So he was trapped, and they found him, and they killed him. So that was the first tennis, uh, tennis related death. In <laughs> These guys are not lucky. Let's look at the whole group here for a while, because they all start young. James was only 12 in 1406 when he became king. <coughs> His son, 1437, is when they got caught in the flu in the fall. Uh, his son's only six, so there's a period of uh, regency and all that. James III, well, there's unfortunately a 1460 year old picture that time. He's only nine. Oh, James IV was a full 15 years old. Well, he's, he's an old guy compared to the others. But say James V was only 18 months when he became king. And then, of course, there's Mary. She was one week old when she became king. And then her son, James VI, was only 13 months old when he became king. So, this wonderful, strong, important Stuart dynasty is a bunch of kids taking over. So it's, a, it's amazing that the system is as it is. Let's go back to James II. He's the king. He's doing okay. He's one of these warrior kings. And he's the original founder of the National Rifle Association. He's fascinated by guns. And he's always running around checking out new weapons and stuff like that. And they were assaulting a castle one day in, in uh, 1460. And they had this new cannon and uh, they crammed it full of powder and stuff. And they lit the fuse. Well, he lit the little bit of And of course, he blew up. And again, you've got his royal. There. He must be the guy on the right because he's wearing the, the blood of all that. So he was killed by the exploding bombard. When I was talking about this before, I heard everybody think, oh, this is ridiculous. How do you do that? I'm sure you've all heard of the USS Princeton in uh, 1844, where they were testing a new naval gun on board of the ship on the Potomac River. And they invited all the important people, Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, President, to see this new gun. It did the same thing. Fortunately, President Tyler was down below the day and was great when the cannon blew up and killed the Secretary of State and Secretary of Treasury. That's the whole other story. So you can't, you know, 1460, 1844, there's no sense in any of this. Okay. Here's James III, who became king, as we know, when he's nine years old. And he wasn't all that great a king. In fact, he was such a poor king that eventually his wife decided that her son would be a better king. So she began conspiring with opponents of James III to get James the fourth named king, and just at the appropriate moment, he died, and James the fourth took over. Uh, 
very uh, sneaky thing. As it turned out, James IV is the best of the lot. He was absolutely the best steward king. He was well liked. Uh, he was involved. Now we're in the Renaissance period. Here's Renaissance art and uh, thinking to Scotland. He was a very, very good king. So it was uh, quite a change from the earlier people. James IV uh, was interested in military affairs, and he decided that Scotland should become a great sea power. He read Alfred Thayer Mahan, you know, the influence of sea power. <clears throat> anyway, he was a big fan of sea power, so he put a tremendous amount of money into building the biggest. He did a smart thing. He married Margaret Tudor, who is the brother, excuse me, the sister of Henry VIII, Lord Henry VII. So that was a good, that was a good move for the future. But he spent all his money on the Great Life, the biggest navy, the largest warship in the world. And it would have been great if there had been a naval battle. But Instead, the French called upon him to help, called upon the Scots to help him against the English. So James IV beautifully pulled together the army and headed south. They captured a couple of castles and then they ran into a huge British English force led by none other than Henry VIII at a place called Plum Field. So the Battle of Flottenfield happened in September 1513. James was killed, nine girls were killed, a couple dozen clan chiefs were killed. It just absolutely wiped out the whole top level of Scottish society that is going on. So it was a real disaster. <coughs> And then I now have to take a, a small byword to talk about Protestantism. As you all know, Martin Luther attached his, attacked his 95 Theses on the Church in Wittenberg in 1517, and it changed the whole world. Everybody was Catholic up until then. The Pope kind of ran stuff, and this just changed things enormously. John Knox is the most famous of the Scottish Protestants, and uh, he is a factor in politics as well as religion uh, throughout this whole period. The person most interested in this in the British Isles was Henry VIII. He was king of England and Ireland, and came to the off came to the power in the power of 1509. Flawed and field was 15, 13, four years later. He's a very, very powerful. Effective monarch. And one thing he couldn't do was follow his son. His wife was Catherine of Aragon. She was the daughter of the uh, Spanish king. And they didn't have, they had a lot of uh, stillborn children and then one daughter, Mary, but no son. And so Henry VIII decided to have to change her in for different models. So he appealed to the Pope to give him a divorce from Catherine Aaron. And the Pope said, no way we're going to do that. Of course you can't do the divorce. So then uh, uh, this guy that's in the, uh, gosh, what's his name? They're bringing up the bodies. His advisor says, Cromwell. Cromwell says, well, look, if you just uh, name yourself a Pope, if you give yourself a you give yourself a divorce. And he says, huh, how do you? Well, just say you're no longer under the Catholic Church. Create your own Church of England, and then you'll be the boss, you'll be the equivalent of the Pope, and you can ask yourself, can I get divorced? And you'll say yes. And that's what they did. He'd already picked his next Congress and both. 
And so he went through the process. They established a whole new church, which was only possible because Protestantism was already there. If it hadn't been for Martin Luther, it wouldn't have happened. But they did it. So they set up the Church of England, and Pope Henry, read Pope King Henry, in the divorce he wanted. He married Anne Bowen. He didn't do anything to Catherine Tar. I mean, Catherine America. She could hang around, but she was she was the discarded ex-wife now. Although she claimed because she was Catholic, she wasn't divorced, which caused a few problems down the line. So and a thousand days. A thousand days went by, no son. Just this doggone other daughter, Elizabeth. So then Henry decides how to trade her in on a new model and Jane Seymour would like to like the choice. So he didn't actually divorce uh, Anne Bowen, he just uh, concocted them that she was a, a traitor and had her actually her and Jane Seymour, who actually had a son and then died a child. So he went out here and uh, three of her, three of her. So he's a big factor in the story here. Meanwhile, James V has become king at the death of his father at Waterfield. And he was, what was he? He married a, a French uh, princess who died, but he liked the, uh, the, the type of woman she was. So he married another French woman, <coughs> Mary of Guise. And the Guise family was the Machiavellian family that was running the French politics at this time, a very powerful family. So Mary of Guise really is a very important player. Uh, they had a son. Uh, they're always in opposition to the king in England. But meanwhile, the king in England has changed the church. So he contacted James and said, hey, how would you like to be a member of this new church? And James says, what's it called? Church of England? No, I don't think so. There really is a church in Scotland, but that's another story. So James didn't really cooperate with Henry VIII. And the result was that Henry VIII then uh, began what he called the rough rule of Scotland. He goes after them because he had this cool idea that he could have one of their children marry his son, the one that James Seymour had produced, and then this would tie things together. We had that idea before. And they said, No, I don't think so. Because the person that would have been involved is the daughter of these people, and her name is Mary. This happened in a most Interesting way. James was off fighting somewhere, and he knew his wife was going to give birth. His wife was going to give birth, and he wasn't there. So, just like Alexander the Third, he got on his horse and he rode all the way to Edinburgh and discovered that she had given birth to a girl. And he was so upset that he died in the book. So Mary, the baby, a week after her birth, became the Queen of Scots. Henry wanted her, now three weeks old or four weeks old, to marry his son, Edward. Her mother, Mary of Guise, said, no way. She instead took Mary off to France to protect her from this English idea. So she went over there and eventually married the, the son of the king of France. She was 15, I think, so she'd been grown up. She married the king of France. And then things get even more complicated because. Henry VIII died in 1547. And his son, who was the son of James Seymour and him, became King Edward VI. 
he was a very sickly child. He only lived, as you can see, for six years. And then he died. And then the English had to decide what to do. Well, the Scots had proven they could have a queen. Why not just have a queen? Who's the oldest of the surviving daughters of Henry VIII? Mary, the daughter of uh, Catherine of Aragon. So Mary becomes queen. Complicated because she's a Catholic. She has to be a Catholic or she's illegitimate. See, if she maintains that she's Catholic and her mother was never divorced from her father, then she's legitimate. So in addition to being very pious, she has to stay him. So Catholic that she actually marries the king of Spain, the new king of Spain, uh, Philip. Well, they dutifully tried to have a child, but they didn't. And then Mary died. 1558. And the English said, now what are we doing? Oh, we had Edward and Mary. Oh, yeah, there's Elizabeth. Yeah, she's just legitimate. Okay. So they brought Elizabeth in. And Elizabeth becomes the queen. <coughs> and she, of course, is Mary. Uh, she's called the heretic by Philip. Philip's idea was when Mary and I, well, I'll just marry Elizabeth. And Elizabeth said, dream on, loser. I'm not going to do that. Forget that. So that creates a fiasco down the line because Philip is not so annoying. They have the Armada in 1588. Uh, you know, this creates terrible relations between England and Spain. But Elizabeth is not playing this game. Meanwhile, in France, the king has died, and Mary, Queen of Scots' husband, Francois, has become king. And so he says, he's looking at the genealogy of the church, and says, hey, you've got as much of a claim to be king of England as, as this upstart heretic here. So uh, he's set up to go ahead and basically establish his wife as the queen, <coughs> and then there'll be France and England are married later on. So that's a great idea that he died. So uh, Mary Christos comes back to Scotland at the age of 16. She's a widow, and there she is. The good thing, from a historical perspective, is that Elizabeth, in order to justify her position in the, in the business, had to be a Protestant. Because if she allowed Catholicism in there, then she was illegitimate. She's only legitimate if you agree that King Henry had the right to uh, get the divorce and all that stuff. So Elizabeth is a firm promise. And that then means that she's at odds with Mary, who is a Catholic. So the English don't want another Catholic in there. So Mary doesn't have much of a shot at that. So Mary has to make her own way in the world. And to everybody's total amazement, she suddenly decided to marry her, I think he's a second cousin, he's a steward, Henry Stewart, Lord Army, uh, who was like 18 years old. She's now in her twins. And they have a baby. However, Henry Stewart is very, very jealous of Mary's friends, in particular a guy named David Riccio, who's her Italian-born chief of staff. And so he arranged with a bunch of other guys to all get drunk and they all kill Riccio. Well, okay, that's kind of bad. So then uh, a few weeks later, his house burned down. Henry's house burned down. And doggone he wasn't inside it. But the autopsy revealed that he'd been strangled before the fire. And who was involved in this? A guy named Hopewell. 
Well, then Mary married Hopewell. And that was the end as far as the Scots were concerned. This is too much. So they forced her to abdicate in 1567 when her son James VI is now 15 months old. So now she's a woman about a country and anything like that. Uh, she's actually locked up in Loch Levin Castle. And then in the early uh, 1650s, 60s, she escaped, tried to raise a group of supporters to, to get back into control, and she loses. So she escaped to England and appealed to her cousin, Elizabeth to take her in, and cousin Elizabeth took her in and promptly locked her up in jail again. Or she stayed until uh, Elizabeth's advisor said, you got to get rid of her. And so they concocted the treason issue with her, and just like Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn, when you do the traitor, she'd come off her hands. So Mary Rhea Scotts lost her head. In uh, 16, uh, no, 15, 1587. Oh, James VI is the baby son of Mary Queen of Scots and Lord Darwin. And he is a committed Protestant because he knows he's read the genealogy term. He is the only one who has a claim to the English throne if Elizabeth dies childless. So he cows around pretty well with the English. It's a tough time on everybody because of religion, uh, and that's a whole other time, time for. <clears throat> but eventually, in uh, 1685, uh, he married uh, Anne of Denmark. 1585, he basically signs a, an agreement with the English that they'll not play each other anymore. Very sure she hated him, he hated her. They did have a child. And then, in 1603, Elizabeth died, and the people in England said, okay, fine, you're the direct line, you're the only one we've got. So he went down to London and became King James I of England. And this is confusing from then on, because he's changed the sixth of Scotland and he's changed the first of England. But he's the guy, he's the King James guy who had published the King James version of the Bible and all that. He only went back to Scotland one more time in his whole 20 years in England. Uh, he completely gave it up. He's a totally English king. <coughs> his son, James died in 1625. His son is Charles I. Charles I is a steward. He's directly related all the way back to Mary Queen of Scots and through that all the way back up the line. Uh, but he only went to Scotland twice. And so he was born in Scotland, left when he was three, and only went back to get crowned the King of Scotland. He was a Protestant, but he was not a Puritan. And the Puritans, the Calvinists, were now in charge in Scotland. So they didn't take kindly to what he was doing. And in fact, he tried to impose on them a thing called the Book of Common Prayer. The Scots didn't want to have to deal with this English thing. He created a whole subset called the Covenanters. Uh, and uh, so it's a mess. But he's got a mess at home too because the Puritans, the Calvinists in England, are now rising up in power as well. In 1639, he decided to invade Scotland to try to establish control over a now very fractious group. 
and he was unsuccessful. Uh, he was captured. He ran up a lot of debts. So in 1641, he had to call a parliament, because according to European tradition, he could only levy taxes with representation. There had to be a parliament approved taxes, so he calls a parliament. This is what's known as the Long Parliament. It sat from 1641 until 1649, it never dissolved itself, and was a thorn in his side all along. In the middle of the uh, 1640s, he's at odds with no countrymen, he's at odds with the Puritans, and finally in 1649, they decide he's got to go. They captured him and chopped off his head too. So that's the end of that story. Oliver Cromwell is the Puritan guy. He takes over in 1649 and establishes the Puritan Commonwealth. No king, none of that stuff. And uh, everything is a mess. The Scots try to stay out of it, but he goes up there and takes care of them. He goes with Ireland. Cromwell which runs the whole British Empire. And the result is continuing this until Cromwell died in 1659. At that point, the English want to reestablish their monarchy, and they find Charles, the son of Charles I, hanging out in France, and they invite him back to be king of England. He's been king before, but he's not going to be king of England. He's a steward. He's Charles Stuart. He does these and so he becomes king. And things continue to be kind of messy because there's still leftover Catholics and Protestants and non Puritans and all that. In the late 18, in late 1670s, uh, there's a thing called the Killing Time in Scotland with various religious groups killing off members of the other groups. It's a real mess. But nothing at all like what happens when he died. 1685. And James II takes over. James is Charles's brother, not his son, but he's also a steward. He's also a member of the I say he's the first Jacobite. Why do they call him Jacobite? His name is James. In Latin, the name James is listed as Jacobus. So if you look at all the paintings, it's Jacobus instead of James. So if they call themselves the Jacobites, the people will be in favor of James. James is, of all horrible things, a Catholic. The English don't want a Catholic. And very quickly, it alienates enough people that they decide to dredge up an alternative. They go over to Holland, and they find William of Orange, and his wife, Mary, who is the daughter of James the II, James, yeah, James the Second of England, James the Seventh of London. So she's a legitimate steward too. And what the Mary for? They roused out Chase King, ex King James, off to Europe. And they take over. And William is a very, very uh, effective military leader. And so that's the way things stand until we have this blend of this. If you ever go to Scotland, there's this mystical, horrible thing that happened in Glencoe. When William took over in England, he insisted that everybody be loyal to him. And he insisted that all the Irish chiefs. Be loyal to him. And they had a deal set up where um, they said, if you don't sign, if you don't state that you are loyal to the king on January 1st, 1692, you're going to be an enemy of the state. And to everybody's amazement, all the chiefs signed. They were finished with this. They all agreed to be loyal to King William. But one little group that lived in Glencoe. Group of the Collins that lived in Glencoe kind of missed the day. The chief decided what to do. He went up to Fort William, which was a military post, a little 
ways away. And the military guy said, I can't, I can't, I'm not involved in this. That's a political issue. You've got to talk to a political person. First, the nearest political person. He's an Inverary, which is 95 kilometers to the south. So the chief dutifully gets down there, 95 kilometers in the middle of the winter, and there's nobody in the office. So it wasn't until January 6th that he actually signed off saying he was not on the team. That was enough to invoke this. King Williams tells the commander in chief of Scotland, if McDonald and Wendell and that tribe can be well separated from the rest, it will be a proper vindication of the public justice to extirpate that sect of thieves. I love that concept of a sect of thieves. <laughs> Well, so the Campbell uh, military guy goes down there with 100 people, and they go down to Glen Poe, and the McDonald's are required by, by Highland tradition to entertain these people. So they entertain them for two weeks, and then Captain Campbell gets. You are hereby ordered to fall upon the rebels and the dolls of Glen Poe and put all the sword under seven. They're to stir all avenues of no man escape. You are put in execution at five o'clock precisely. So at 5 a.m., two minutes, burst into the chief's bedroom and stabbed him to death. 38 other people were killed and dozens more escaped in a blinding a snowstorm, and there was no market shop for them to hide out in. Uh, so the Glen Hill Massacre was a terrible thing. What William had wanted to do was to make sure everybody respected him, and the Glen Hill Massacre was exactly the wrong thing to do. So it was a, a very bad thing. Uh, in 1702, well, Mary. William Murray died in 1694. Mary takes uh, William died in 1702, and Anne became queen. Anne was the sister of Mary. She's the steward. And she became queen of England in 1702. And then we have the act of union. Here's the, I like this because you can see they all have the same eyes. That's Margaret Tudor. She's the grandmother of Mary Queen of Scots. And Mary Queen of Scots is the great grandmother of those two. They, I mean, they're amazingly similar. Okay, the problem was that Anne had 17 babies, none of whom lived past the age of 11. So when she was going to no people in her line. So they looked at the geology charts to figure out if this was related to King Henry's sister in law. And they figured out that the King of Hanover was probably the closest people. So they told this to the Scots that we're going to do this. And the Scots said, okay, well, if you're going to do that, we have to get something in return. So the user. <laughs> Scotland and England become one country, the United Kingdom. I say green. And it's all because the Scots want to get the green bills. So in 1714, this Canadarian becomes king. The Scots are upset. But they can't do much about it. There's an attempt at a rebellion in 1750, right after this happened. What did I say? The password. They're going to try to bring back the Scottish monarch in France, where he's in exile. James II has now died, so it's James III, who's known as the Old Pretender. He's James Francis Edward Stewart. He's the old pretender. Okay, that's what I did. I'm trying to get him back. So, what do you want to get into? And things go on pretty much the way you expect until the reign of George II. 
and the son of James Third of England, James the Eighth of Scotland. This is Monica's writing. He's Charles Edward Stewart. He's the son, and he goes over to Scotland to try to get things organized. The English are off in the war in Europe, and he arrives. He rousts troops. They get all excited. He ends up at Holyrood Palace, which is the traditional palace in Edinburgh. He's in charge. And they head down south. They get within 150 miles of London. And the king is packing up to go back to Hanover to get out of this. But instead, his son, the Duke of Cumberland, he's the son of King George II, organizes a huge army to go up and put this down. Meanwhile, the Scots are retreating up to the north for the winter, uh, planning to have a big rise in the spring, and they are all the way up in Inverness, which is way up at the north end of Loch Ness. And Cumberland shows up with this huge army, and they meet at Culloden Field, which is just a little farm field. The British had all kinds of artillery, the Scots had this sword, and a few muskets. He has a battle last 40 minutes and half the Scotch were killed. And those that were injured on the field were then abandoned by these troops. So that's the end of it. One of his was he wanted to die on the field, but they grabbed him and couldn't wait. They hung out in the highlands for another five months until Flora McDonald decided to rescue him. She got a passport for herself and her servant, Betty Burke. And so she got on the boat with her servant, Betty Burke, who was really on his charter dressing dress. And scared him off the sky, and then he was taken off. Um, so that's the end of the Scottish independence and the end of the Stuart. Flora McDonald eventually, uh, she was arrested, thrown in the Tower of London, then she migrated to Carolina, then she moved back to the sky where she was in. One of the things that you don't realize in all this is how things change. If you're a historian, I'm very, I'm very familiar with the idea that sometimes in a movie they'll have a long American flag, a long number of stars. I grew up with the way stars. Now they're 50. Uh, the English flag is a combination of these three flags. There's the St. George Cross, and you see this in England a lot these days. There's the St. Andrew's Cross, and then there's the St. Patrick's Cross. When the two countries were merged in 1608 under James, They put the Scottish flag behind first. That's the flag, incidentally, that if you watch a movie about the Revolutionary War, that's the flag the British were fighting. It won't be that way. Because they'll have the one that when Ireland joined, they put the cross of St. Patrick into the two. That's St. George Cross, St. Andrew Cross, and St. Patrick. Now, if you have a call, what's the relationship? Elizabeth II is the 14th generation descendant of the Mary First So that happened to America. It's a beautiful castle on the northeast coast of Scotland. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. I always get a kick out of this too, and I appreciate you coming.
this is very hard to do in an empty room with the Zoom thing. So <laughs> even though I did have a whole lot of feedback there, I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>